Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to do uh, every year a geopolitical panel at the VMC, which is a tradition we started a few years ago, because we realize that, <clears throat> as a colleague of ours at ICMPD always says, you can't solve migration issues often with migration policy. You need other policies to, to solve migration issues. And I wanted to begin today by uh, saying that before this incredibly traumatic year we had, where everyone has been so focused on the, the huge migratory challenge and, of course, the war in Ukraine and the huge uh, uh, outflow of refugees from Ukraine, that last year, the biggest event in EU asylum and, and migration policy for many years was actually the weaponization of irregular migration flows by the current Belarus regime. So I just wanted to take a quick moment, actually, to remind you about what actually happened. So <clears throat> from, early to, uh, er, from early to mid to late last year, Belarus's leader, uh, Alexander Lukashenko, tried to use 20,000 or around 20,000 asylum seekers to, to rush the EU's eastern frontier, targeting first Lithuania and then Poland from August onwards, uh, Lukashenko lured Iraqis, various African nationals, and Syrians with single entry visas to Minsk via Turkey, the Middle East, and Central Asia. Now, in that flow, it was a mixed flow. Small numbers of Afghans, Iranians, Indians, and even Cubans were among that cohort. Uh, having paid up to 12,000 euros each for the passage uh, to, to Germany, as we, were, we heard this morning from the Lithuanian deputy minister, they were told, we'd basically get you straight into Germany. The travelers were then pushed towards the frontier by the Belarusian regime in now scenes that we, I think we will remember, even despite Ukraine, the, the unbelievable scenes on television, of the, in order to force a confrontation with border guards and to tip the EU again, once again, into panic and division over the, EU, over the issue of migration, because Lukashenko had obviously seen the events of 2015 and 2016 and how divisive and destructive that was to European politics. Now, unlike that time, the EU's response was actually quite robust. It also developed a brand new toolbox almost overnight for stemming the flows in cooperation with third countries. Uh, Vice President Margarita Skinas, who spoke to us last night uh, from a new whistle-stop tour, then did a whistle-stop tour, if you remember, to Dubai, to Jordan, to Ankara, uh, to Beirut and to a number of other places where he was able to, uh, to negotiate and incentivize cooperation with uh, partners. Uh, one of the most important partners was Turkish Airlines because uh, they were able to convince uh, private operators that a small trickle of flights to Minsk was not worth a two billion stake in the European aviation market. So. We Europeans for once uh, actually, although many I know in the room may criticize later that the response was too slow, uh, they, actually, they actually managed to bring an end to the crisis more quickly than was expected. They managed to use tools that they hadn't used before. And Alexander, Alexander Lukashenko might have accidentally reinvented European migration diplomacy through his actions. Now, now what exactly were his motivations in what he did was something that we'll be discussing in one second, and what it means for European asylum policy, we still don't know, because at the moment on the table in the EU, the EU is still considering, yes, the crisis was brought under control, and we can debate the merits the, the, and demerits of how it was handled in a minute, but we haven't decided the, the structural changes that this will bring to European asylum legislation, European crisis management legislation. At the moment on the table in the, in the Council, we are, we are revisiting the Schengen Borders Code for the issue of instrumentalization. We are looking again at the EU's asylum, management, uh, asylum and migration management regulation with a view to what happens in an instrumentalization crisis, something that we had never thought of before. So while this uh, seemed like, it, to us Europeans, of course, we can be quite Eurocentric in Europe and everything is, happens to us, it's happened for the first time. Uh, but of course, not only... Americans are definitely not that way. <laughs> uh, uh, but of course, this had happened even in Europe many times before. And as the EU comes to consider its response, uh, now that we have at least some breathing space on this matter, we need to understand this phenomenon in a deep way. And we need to understand 
uh, its, uh, its manifestations, what are typically is at stake in the game between a country or a party that is trying to use irregular migration flows in this way, and what the defending state can do. Now, I want to very, very clearly put the proviso down right now that when we're discussing this, uh, because Kelly, uh, who I'm going to properly introduce in one second, uh, is a political scientist and international relations theorist. Uh, I obviously work in ICMPD. If, if it seems like we're discussing this matter coldly, it is only to help deepen the understanding so that migrants are never used as negotiating chips in this way again. So please, I want to put, put that proviso down now, including for the 1,200 people watching from, from elsewhere, that this is clearly understood and we are not trivializing the matter and we are not forgetting that, you know, the awful human scenes that were there last we're year. We're not endorsing it. And certainly we're not endorsing it. Uh, having said that, we'd like to conduct this conversation in good spirits. And uh, without further ado, there's nobody better to, to help us understand and get a deeper, uh, deeper sense of this phenomenon than Professor Kellyanne Greenhill, who is fa faculty appointments at Tufts University and MIT. I think you did your PhD at MIT yes, as well. Yes. And you, you did your bachelor's in Harvard, as I understand. Uh, I have a have something, uh, a, I have a piece of paper from Harvard, but I, I uh, went to college at Berkeley. I'd like UC a piece Berkeley. of paper from both of those places, so, <laughs> or all four of those places. Uh, also, what I didn't realize, Kelly, and we've been actually chatting all year about this phenomenon, uh, uh, that you have also been in, out, in and out of government at various points and also advising international organizations at various points. And I must say, uh, Kelly, in addition to that, you are, of course, the author of a very famous book called Weapons of Mass Migration, Forced Displacement, Coercion and Foreign Policy, where you have comprehensively documented this phenomenon in 2011. And now you're working on a new version of the book because um, you're, you were, for many years, a voice crying in the wilderness, trying to convince people that you weren't Genghis Khan, this just happens. And it may not happen in isolation of, with other things, but it is a phenomenon. And just the first point, I was very struck by a footnote in your book where you, were, you, were, you said you were speaking at an international conference. Somebody came up to you and said, listen, I mean, your, your arguments are perfectly well made. Uh, I find them very persuasive. I find them very convincing, but I just don't believe that this ever actually happens. And uh, you, I, so you, you've had to conquer that skepticism. And, but I think after Lukashenko's uh, <laughs> uh, intervention last year, nobody will doubt uh, again. But I, I, let's, let's do the first, uh, the jumping off point here. And it's great that we're finally having this conversation because, you know, you're basically turning me into your postdoc student at this point. I'm getting back notes with like handwritten corrections from Kelly uh, uh, where I haven't understood something properly. So in terms of terminology, let's start off with how do we think about the different kinds of instrumentalization, weaponization, whatever you want to call it? Uh, so I will answer that question in just a second. I do want to take this opportunity to also note uh, to I guess, fix a common misapprehension about um, Belarus's use of this tool. It, even his employment of travel agents and, put, uh, and um, trying to encourage people from coming from other parts of the world to Minsk to then send them on to the European Union, even that was not new. Uh, Lukashenko ripped a page right out of Eric Conacher's, East German Her Eric Conacher's playbook. This is exactly what he did in the mid-1980s. He used newspaper ads. He placed them in newspapers all over the Middle East and in South Asia, encouraging people to come to East Berlin, uh, promised them safe and comfortable transit and easy uh, and unimpeded transport into West Berlin. Uh, and people took, uh, excuse me, took, I honor God his word, um, these folks traveled on Soviet bloc airlines to Berlin. They were uh, transited into West Germany. Asylum uh, applications into West Germany went up by 109% between 1984 and 1985. And uh, Germany had to eventually make a number of concessions to Honecker, financial, uh, technical assistance, and a few others. So just as a, a little parenthetical note there. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the instrumentalization of migration, uh, there are four variants or four different ways in which this tool can be used. Uh, the first is what I call dispossessive engineer migration, and that's effectively where 
mass migrations are threatened or induced in order to seize the property or the territory of a particular group or to, should say, def defang them as a potential threat to the dominance of the group that's uh, inducing the migration. And a recent example would be the Myanmar junta's um, mass uh, forced migration or even genocide, if you will, of Rohingya, uh, 101 point, excuse me, 1.4 million of forcibly displaced uh, out of um, Myanmar into neighboring Bangladesh and elsewhere. A second variant is export of engineered migration, and that is, those are threatened or actual out migrations designed to defang, or de uh, defang domestic dissidents, uh, discomfort, humiliate, or otherwise even in extremists destabilize uh, potential target states. And I think that's exactly what uh, Lukashenko was up to. He may have had other agendas, but uh, apropos of what we heard from our Lithuanian colleague this morning, regime re revenge, that sounds a lot of, like export of engineered migration. The third variant is uh, militarized engineered migration, and that's uh, real or threatened uh, movements of, mass movements of people undertaken to gain battlefield advantage. And we often see this in the context of armed conflict. Um, because the dominant form of conflict in the world today is civil wars, we don't see this happening as often on the international stage in the here and now. But one might say, even in the context of the Syrian civil war, ISIS's use of militarized engineered migration in the service or the pursuance of the um, greater caliphate be an example of militarized engineered migration. And finally, there's coercive engineered migration, which is often conflated or used synonymously with instrumentation. And again, instrumentation is broader, but coercive engineered migration refers to real or threatened out migrations designed to extract concessions, uh, economic, military, or political from a target state or states. And um, That's interesting uh, that you, you wanted to start with that uh, proviso about Honecker because uh, actually when I, the big theme I take, well, one big theme I take from your work is the danger of forgetting that this has all happened before. Uh, and, I, I, and before, I, and before. Yes, prob probably since the time of Babylon, uh, there were, uh, you know, the idea of using population movements to discomfort an opponent in some way, or to get a political advantage. You know, I think you could, you, you started your work in from 1957 for a very particular reason, or 1951, me, because of the Geneva Convention. Exactly. Uh, and uh, in, that, in that sense, uh, there's a real danger to, to, you know, the US is one example. Uh, I think there was a very good example in your book that when the Marielle boat lift, when the Cuban, uh, Cubans started coming in boats to the States, mm -hmm. that uh, officials were baffled that, uh, that they, they, they had to relearn all the lessons because Castro had already used this before, right? Yes, 15 years before. And in fact, Victor Palmieri, who was the highest ranking US official who had to deal with this problem, came out of the Situation Room eight days into the crisis. And someone mentioned Kemi Oroka, which was the first massive Cuban outflow and happened in 1965. And Palmieri went and said, wait, you mean this has happened before? It com completely blew his mind. And he was the highest ranking US official tasked with dealing with this situation. Nobody had briefed him. Um, and this has happened also time and time again. And to the extent that we continue to forget the lessons of these past crises, we cripple ourselves in terms of combating them or deterring them. In the no, I, th I, I think it's a real danger for us in Europe because although uh, I was in, on the inside in the European Council for the 2015 crisis, we were sure the EU could, it is such a politically explosive crisis, we were sure that the EU could never unlearn the lessons from that crisis. But, you know, you can unlearn lessons for a lot of reasons. You can be distracted by other things. Uh, we, the EU has been very distracted by other things in the last couple of years. Uh, COVID, Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. So it's possible to forget to remember if you, in, 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 this, in this respect. And it can take a while. I mean, I, I don't imagine, given the salience of the issue these days, that there's going to be immediate forgetting. But could happen down the line. But I mean, uh, you know, I mean uh, one of the things I found really hard to, to, to grasp in the book is that the US actually ousted a leader of a country over this issue. Well, more than one. Well, <laughs> would, you, would you care to elaborate? Uh, uh, are you referring to Aristide? Yes. Or, okay. Yes. So the story didn't start with uh, Aristide's, um, as we'd say, mm. ass assisted relocation, um, golden parachute. But um, rather, when the military, I, I make this quick 
pretty quick. Um, the military junta took over power in Haiti in 1991. And uh, at the time, the Bush administration decided on a policy of summarily treating all Haitians who were fleeing the regime at that time as economic migrants, even though they were fleeing a rather unstable and dangerous situation on the ground in Haiti. Uh, when Bill Clinton was running for president against H.W. Uh, Bush, excuse me, um, he promised to reverse this policy, this racist uh, policy wh whereby Cubans and Haitians were not being treated equitably or, or fairly, and said if he were elected, then Haitians would be treated just like all other potential asylum seekers. Well, Clinton was elected in November 1992, and as may come as no surprise to you, Haitians started building boats and rafts, preparing for their welcome to uh, the US that was um, going to happen. Well, incumbent President Clinton panicked <laughs> and decided this was not exactly what he had in mind when he said he was going to revisit um, US Haiti policy and uh, got in touch with uh, exiled President Jean Bertrand Aristide and said effectively, can we make a deal? I'll do what I can diplomatically to get you reinstalled into power. Do what you can to make sure that, I, that we don't have a Haitian boat person or potential asylum seeker crisis to coincide with my inauguration day. Clinton says, you know, Clinton uh, and Aristide make a deal. Time passes. Aristide remains out of power. More time passes, Aristide remains out of power. Um, some pressure starts mounting domestically to see Haitian uh, pol uh, US policy towards Haitians changed. I'm, I'm simplifying this a bit and telling you in a quick and dirty way, but let's jump forward to the summer, uh, spring and summer of 1994, and after a, a televised hunger strike by Randall Robinson uh, and uh, significant intervention by the Congressional Back Caucus, the Clinton administration does decide to change Haitian policy or policy towards Haitians and Haitians again start building boats and rafts to prepare for their um, welcome in the United States. Clinton again contacts Aristide and says, we should do a deal or I'm, I'm going to get you back in. Aristide says, Basically, I call bullshit. Um, that's a no, technical no. term, I apologize. It's a, um, it's a family your, your, conference. Your credibility uh, is Kelly. shot, I don't believe you. Um, and in fact, not only will I not go on TV and call up my friends and tell them to stay in Haiti, like I did last time, but I'm gonna go on TV, and he did, and say, I can't tell Haitians to remain in what is effectively a house on fire. Tis better to die at sea than to... That's to incredible. That's to die incredible. here, and they did. So the U.S. then launches or prepares to launch a forced entry operation with only the, the approval of only about one third of the American public to see Aristide reinstalled into power. And they don't need to do it because the junta does step down after some last-minute negotiations. Aristide is reinstalled into power in 1994. That's a long preamble, but no, no, that's I, important. I wanted, so I wanted you to tell that story. First, uh, it's important to note that the U.S. was effectively coerced into launching a military operation to um, effect regime change in order to see someone reinstalled in power. Aristide then, though, tries this gambit once again about 11 years later when his regime is again under threat. and. Um, he, Aristide starts making statements saying, unless I get international peacekeepers on the ground here in Haiti, unless I get some help, I can't promise that there won't be another migration crisis. Well, the French immediately call for Aristide to be removed. The U.S. is a little bit more equivocal for a while. Uh, and then overnight, when uh, Aristide appears to be escalating his threats, we decide, we the U.S. decide it's, it's, his time has come. The U.S. sends a plane to Port-au-Prince, and Aristide is, as I said, relocated for an extended period of time to the Central African Republic, and that was the end of the Aristide regime. Okay. That was a long answer to your question. I'm sorry, but I, I only, I wanted several cases embedded in sure, there. Sure. Yeah. I wanted you to tell that story, yeah, okay. just to make it real how real this can get in terms of the, to the highest level uh, of government and the most serious decision a government can make, which is to re re forcibly remove the f leader of another country. Uh, 
but it strikes me also that in that case, you know, why, why uh, can this tactic be used against liberal democracies so effectively? And it's because I think what you call in the book, we have very high hypocrisy costs that basically by espousing the Geneva Convention and, and technically being open to protect asylum seekers, this, uh, this tool can be very well used against us because it's not just the state that uses the, uh, the attacking state uh, that's a player, it's also people inside the receiving state who go, oh no, you, you should let these people in, uh, this is wrong, uh, as would happen in the Lukashenko, Lukashenko case, as would happen with the Cuban. Uh, I've al often looked at the US-Cuba parallel mm -hmm. because under US law, every Cuban is a refugee because the, uh, the, the, anyone fleeing the regime should receive instant uh, refugee status in the US, no? Uh, policies changed. Mm -hmm. um, and that used to be the case, it is no longer the case. I see. Um, I see. But I, I, so I'm interested in this idea of liberal democracies yes. being the chief targets. So, well, so for a long time that was true and it remains true. Uh, hypocrisy costs are what I call in the book a force multiplier, but they are neither necessary nor sufficient to affect this kind of coercion. So there are actually two ways in whereby course of energy migration can be affected, and one is what we might loosely just call capacity swamping, and that's uh, through threats or actual you know, overwhelming a state's or target state's ability to assimilate or respond to a potential um, inflow mm. of displaced people. The, uh, the second um, mechanism is what I call political agitation, and political agitation is blackmail. Is, is, well, they're both, they're both blackmail in some sense, but w in one set of circumstances, you're essentially saying, I'm just going to overwhelm you with people or overwhelm your ability to deal with this crisis. In the other case, is I'm going to um, undermine your willingness. So for in, when we're dealing with advanced industrial countries, many of whom are liberal democracies, it's not about can you as accommodate these people, it's about whether or not you are willing to accommodate these people. And um, in most advanced liberal democracies, there is a heterogeneity of opinions about whether or not displaced people should be taken in. And on one side, there are a group of people who either think this particular group, Cubans, Haitians, Ukrainians, the blank, Ukrainians mm. should be taken in, mm. and they're joined with people who think no matter who the group is, they should be taken in. These are the pro-migrant refugee group. On the other side, there are quite often groups who are opposed to either anybody, you know, mm. broadly opposed, or they're opposed to particular groups. Because I bring this up because it's sorry and, to yeah, interrupt no, it's you. Yeah. Because it's important. Uh, in the Lukashenko case, mm -hmm. there were for many people in Europe, they did not see the hand of a dictator from an authoritarian regime behind the people suddenly arriving at the Lithuanian and Polish border. They just saw the need of these people. Uh, and you know, I don't, I don't say this was right or wrong. These are just the two perspectives on the crisis. Uh, I even had friends of mine from home asking me, "Is this right or wrong?" Uh, what's happening here, and I had to, all I could tell them was but there is a deeper manipulation mm -hmm. going on, mm -hmm. and the question, the question for a lot of people is, well, what would have happened if they just opened the borders in this case, you know, what you call in your list of options, yes. which includes regime change, of course, but then there's the, on the opposite end of the spectrum, there's accommodation, yes. so open the borders, mm -hmm. make it so that the, this is not a weapon at all. Yes. Do you think maybe we should have employed this tactic in this particular case? These are complicated issues, and um, I think it, I would be, um, it would be unfair for me to second-guess what the Europeans did. I'm not a European. Um, I can say that in any given potential crisis, uh, policymakers have a, a toolbox. None of the options is a silver bullet. None is likely to solve a problem. Well, it should take none is guaranteed to uh, solve, make an issue solved uh, in perpetuity, but having options is better than having no options. Sure. There, there's so, two... Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Uh, no, the, there's two other reflections I'd like to explore, which is, number one, there's, uh, there's also much, much softer versions of instrumentalization. Mm -hmm. For example, I was interested when we... You know I'm very interested in the parallels between the US and the European, because I think there's a lot to be learned. So the US managed to end the boat crisis with Haiti, with Cuba. Mm -hmm. In Europe, we have not. We have had a boat crisis for over 10 years and are still 
largely unable to, to decisively address it. Uh, but then that pressure, as we see today, in the last year in the US, there's been a huge crisis on the US land border, mm -hmm. and that is almost linked to the ending of the boat crisis in a way, because it's as a result of a more passive, I don't know, would you describe it as instrumentalization, but it's the visa policy of Nicaragua, no? I, I would say that's a contributing factor. Oh, there may be other people in, in the audience who want to weigh in on this, but um, let's say it's not helping the matter, uh, but I wouldn't say it's a, um, the sole cause of the explosion in arrivals on the southern border. But, Something like two um, million people, I understand. Two million people in the last year. Uh, That's much higher than you. And yes. Um, so it is a contributing factor, no doubt. I'm not sure how many people in the audience know that Nicaragua, similar to the Western Balkans, brouhaha, that uh, Nicaragua offered visa-free travel to all Cubans starting last November. Um, Available evidence, which is arguably scant, um, does suggest that both Cuba and Nicaragua are benefiting economically from this little arrangement, but also it's, I think, uh, unequivocally the case that both Cuba and Nicaragua can see this as a potentially effective political tool against the U.S. in the way that it has been in the past. Um, if nothing else, than as a sort of Damocles to hold over the U.S.'s head in the context of there's X, you know, 200,000 Cubans came in the last year, how many might come in the future? And it's worth noting that 200,000 is a significantly larger number than the 125,000 who came during the Mario boat lift. And, and Jimmy Carter, although I'm not sure, I don't think he's right about this, but Carter is convinced he lost the 1980 election because of the Mario boat lift. There was the Iran hostage crisis and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and the economy wasn't in great shape. There were other things going on, but, but Carter is convinced. And also, the cast of characters that we've heard from before, Bill Clinton is convinced he lost his gubernatorial re-election because of the Cubans who were stationed in a military bases inside Arkansas that year, and there were some non-trivial non um, problems mm -hmm. associated with them being hosted there. So the two American um, political leaders convinced that they lost important elections in 1980 due to Mariel. Mm -hmm. uh, we're moving towards a sort of yes. maybe taking some questions from the audience, but before we did that, I also wanted to point out that uh, in many cases the attack, the attacker, be they a state or be they a non-state, because we have also said it's non-states, uh, be they Nicaragua, be they Cuba, be they uh, Colonel Gaddafi in Libya, mm -hmm. they, they can, it's a dangerous tactic to use. Yes. Your research shows that it's very often the, the tool of the weak or the weaker party in order to draw attention to other political issues that they feel is being ignored, but they can also lose control of the issue. Yes. They can lose control, they can trigger migratory flows, but then they can lose, they can then become the victim of them themselves. Is this a... Uh... So, in the number of, in the cases I identified for the first edition of the book, in about 80% of the cases, the uh, challenger was, in capability sense, weaker than the targets, and about 20% the coercer was more powerful, and in the remaining 10%, they had about equal power. Mm -hmm. um, it is rarely a tool of first resort. Quite often, this is a tool that's used by actors who feel like they need to get the attention of advanced liberal democracies or wealthy countries who are not willing to talk to them uh, or who feel hard done by. And so this tool can be a, a method of leveling the playing field and opening up discussion space that wasn't previously open. Mm -hmm. I'm not advocating it, but that it is viewed as a tool that is seen as necessary by some actors. Well, it has happened, um, yes. so we know it. Uh, I'd like to uh, open up to maybe a round of questions, maybe two, three questions. Roman and our colleague will, will, will collect some, if there are any. We have one over here at the back. Well, thank you, uh, David Kipp. My name from SWP in Berlin. Uh, very fascin fascinating talk, uh, and um, I was just wondering in the list of options if you could still talk a bit about that and maybe also about uh, the case of the EU-Turkey agreement um, and how uh, that option is, is something that um, yeah, has been uh, used before and maybe um, also will be used uh, in other cases. Uh, yeah, how do you see that? 
a particular example within, uh, within this uh, framework? Uh, so the uh, just oh, sorry, yes, Kelly. I'm going to try several? and get a okay. question from. Uh, yes. I think the U.S. has been mentioned enough okay. that Martha deserves to take the floor. No, no statement. Just a question. Um, actually, two. Uh, so in the previous panel, what was mentioned? They mentioned about <clears throat> various states in the United States busing or flying people. Darn it! I was hoping you were going to answer the question. I was going to evade it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Do you consider that instrumentalization? Okay. And then my second question is a nomenclature question. Your book, Weapons of, of Mass mm -hmm. Migration, right? Um, f folks have, have had problems with using the word weaponization because it does um, play yeah, into okay. the idea that migrants are dangerous and thus weapons. And so there's been you know, talk about saying just use the word instrumentalization or use the word exploitation, which I'm not in favor of because migrants are exploited in so many ways that it doesn't. But I'm curious if you have now, years after the publishing of your book, if you have a different preference for a verb. Uh, Tobias, but also at the back, wants to. Uh, Thank you very much, Tobias Molander from the Austrian Ministry of the Interior. Thank you very much for this most uh, fascinating uh, panel. Um, I think um, this important uh, topic um, uh, is so timely because it puts the spotlight on two of the most press pressing issues that we face at the moment. The one thing is uh, the lack of an efficient and effective asylum immigration policy in the European Union. And the second thing is the lack of an efficient and strong foreign policy of the European Union. Although, as uh, Hugo mentioned, we were quite successful in the case of the Belarusian crisis. I'm not yet completely sure if we react that quickly and well in all the cases. My question would be um, instrumentalization, I think, is threefold a political, legal, and moral dilemma because in the cases of um, Belarus and other cases, there was a strong political agreement in Europe that what we were doing was just and right to protect our external borders, that we must not be blackmailed. But on the other hand, as, as Hugo said, with the uh, Geneva Convention, we have uh, strong legal obligations in the field of asylum, in the field of non refoulement How can you really reconcile those two ideals, strong, effective borders, without violating the principle of non refoulement in that regard? And I also want to refer, for example, to Gerald Knaus, the uh, migration expert, who brought up the idea of agreements with safe third countries that people who are in protection needs should be able to apply for asylum but not remain within the European Union. Maybe you can react on that as well. Thank you very much. Okay, okay I think that's enough for the okay. limited time we have left. So, uh, Kelly, if you want to take most of those things, mm -hmm. and I could talk about the EU-Turkey side, if you liked, or if sure. you can okay. take them all, Either, it right. doesn't matter. So, I'll, I, I, first I have to apologize to the last questioner. There was something about the acoustics here. If I have mangled your question and I don't answer it, uh, please ask it again, w whether that's during the panel or after the fact. But what my takeaway was, how do you reconcile the principle of non um and the uh, clear and um, quite understandable desire of states to protect their borders? And I would say, it's really hard. Um, and that's, in fact, why this tool works, uh, because uh, leaders are caught between a rock and a hard place. And if in all cases, one could simply decide we're going to take all of these people, or we didn't care about human rights protections, and I think we should, um, and we're just going to close our border, then leaders wouldn't be in a conundrum. But it's not possible to simultaneously take in a group and keep them out. And thus, the incentives to concede um, in whole or in part to the demands of some of these coercers can become quite acute. Um, which is why what I found in the, uh, looking at the data for the book, uh, the, the cases I identified by 2011, that um, in about three quarters of cases, targets uh, conceded in part to coercers' demands. In about 57% of cases, they conceded to all of the articulated demands of challengers, coercers. And you might say 57%, that's not that high. It seems like maybe a coin flip. But um, the US's own track record on coercive diplomacy, we're the most powerful uh, country in, in the international system. When we throw our military might around and try to get others to do our bidding, 
best case scenario, we're successful, or be, you know, best estimate, we're successful about 40% of the time. So even 57% is pretty efficacious. That being said, for reasons Hugo already mentioned, this is not a tool of first resort, and so it may be the case that it's actually still a pretty lousy method of persuasion, but it's only used by actors who are pretty darn sure that their targets are going to be vulnerable. So if you carefully choose your targets, then your success rate is going to appear, if you will, artificially high. So there are many actors who might be self-deterred. So if, if, that was, if that answered your question, I, you know, then great. If it didn't, please um, ask it again later. Uh, in answer to Marta's question, um, Marta's questions, uh, I would say yes, this is a kind of what, what's going on domestically is a kind of instrumentalization. The focus of my work, most of my work here before, hasn't been within the domestic context, but uh, speaking to the aforementioned Cuban and Haitian cases, this isn't actually the first time we've seen political circuses um, or you know, three-ring circuses whereby people are involuntarily moved within our country, or we see activities undertaken by governors that upend or call into question the viability of federal responses. So even this is not new. Um, this particular flavor, I'm not aware of something that looks exactly like what's going on now, but it certainly rhymes uh, very tightly with some of the things we've seen before. In terms of would I rename the book? Um, no. Um, I think you're just a very good writer. I mean, <laughs> you, it, it's un, you're an unusual academic in that you are a very good writer. I mean, that is rare. And I th personally, I, I bless you for that. You know, that's, uh, your, your work is readable. Yeah. Well, but I, that's, thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, but. Maybe I had a good editor too, thank you. Um, but uh, people didn't start using these vic the true victims of this tool, the, the displaced themselves. They didn't start using people as weapons when I wrote this book. It's been going on for a very, very, very long time. They didn't stop using it when I wrote this book. Um, that my title is epiphenomenal, um, as we would say in social science. So. Uh, I quite understand people's frustration about that people are being weaponized. I share this frustration, and in fact, that's why I wrote the book, because I think if we don't talk about the fact that this is happening, we can't combat it. And so if more people read this book because of this provocative title, I wouldn't say it's inflammatory, but if more people read this book and we can think about how to combat this tool and better protect those that are deserving of protection, I call that a win. Um, and so. If I sound offensive, I don't mean to sound offensive, but that's, that's my answer. Um, and to the question about the options. The options are four. Uh, the first is concession. And as I've already suggested, more often than not, we see concession. Um, will that change now that the Europeans have a more well-developed toolbox, now that the US is not going to forget uh, anytime soon what's going on? Maybe. That, um, since the second ed of the ed edition of the book is going to be coming out next year, I can make all sorts of new predictions. Yes, but we'll I, 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 I can't um, resist. And, and I know you want to come back to... Jump in because we're yes. running out of time. Okay. Um, second option is uh, making the, the game not worth playing. So, and that can happen either through essentially saying, do your worst, send them all to us, we'll take them. Or it can be through abrogating one's human rights responsibilities. I don't recommend yeah. this, I don't advocate it, but it's an option. But you also have another, also ver you also have another version of this, which yes. I find super, uh, because yes. it's to answer this yes. gentleman's question. So in the book you say, it? you say, confident of their superior yes. strength and position, powerful targets fail to realize until late in the game that they might lose. The added tragedy is that not only does this lead to more migrant victims, but it also leads to suboptimal outcomes for both sides. And then you, in, you go through your three options, because I wanted to get into Tobias's question on vulnerability. Yes. Uh, you, go, you say, you know what? You're better off negotiating early and because you, you will come to an agreement at a lower price. Potentially. Than, potentially, than the teeth of a crisis. Now, many of our member states and officials here will not like that message because they say, we, we are not going to advertise ourselves for blackmail by, by doing... By, by doing deals early, let, letting people know that this is an issue at which they can extract things from ne us. Negotiation is not a deal, number one. But also, historically, I mean, one of the reasons that this tool was hiding in plain sight is that for a very, very long time, both challengers and targets didn't advertise it. Like, 
much of the important diplomacy that goes on in the world, this was happening on the QT. So what I would say to potential target states is when you start hearing noises where disgruntled actors say, you may give me no choice but to resort to something like this, you should take them seriously. That doesn't mean sit down and give them everything they want, but it's pay attention because you're going to have to probably sit down with them anyway if they start a, a migration flow that you're going to have to deal with. So recognize you can do it quietly, you can use the good offices of other parties, uh, you can... You know, there are all sorts of ways mm -hmm. that this diplomacy can happen well, quietly, but... That's, and concession is not the same thing as negotiation, but that... Well, that's I'm not going to describe the okay. EU-Turkey statement yes. as a result of instrumentalization, but I will say it, it definitely was the result of a failure to engage earlier on a clearly pressing need for cooperation Agreed. between the world's biggest refugee hosting state and the European Union. So, Agreed. Uh, but uh, to go back to what Tobias was saying, because yes. I want him to be fully answered, because I know he Maybe will criticise me when, because he wasn't, uh, he, he mentioned this idea of transfer agreements. We're, ah. we're, I mean, we're talking about tactics here, not what's right and wrong. Mm -hmm. So states may say, OK, we'll, we'll take people in, but we're going to send genuine asylum seekers to another country, far, you know, somewhere far away, et cetera, et cetera, so that we're not encouraging a pull factor. And, and indeed, this is one of the options that you have under number two, which is yes. make the game not worth not playing. Worth uh, oddly, the most liberal one of the solutions is, there, and the most, let, for many people here, it would be the most extreme, are under the same category, which is make the game not worth playing. Mm -hmm. That is one, let every Everybody in and say we're not afraid. Uh, and but two, a kind of reverse instrumentalization. Where Rwa let's say a country like Rwanda, which has uh, done uh, agreements with the uh, Denmark and the UK, says, "Well, uh, we're happy to play, pl play with you, as it were, yes. in, if this means so much to you." Uh, it, would you agree with this? Sorry. This goes back to uh, where I started, where I said you know, the, there's options in the toolbox, but we can't necessarily anticipate that it's going to solve the problem forever, because sometimes when we play ball uh, and make these agreements, we then encourage some of these actors who agree to uh, take in people who are displaced to themselves become weaponizers, instrumentalizers. So the island of Nehru, our Australian colleague, uh, may note that you know, Nehru has taken in any number of people to prevent them from ending up in Australia, but in turn has episodically requested um, significant financial payments from Australia. And that is not the only example of this happening. Um, so. Well, States can solve a problem in the short term, make it become less visible, but they also can set them up for set themselves up for secondary uh, instrumentalization down the line. You've made that point that in trying to make yourself less vulnerable, you can actually increase vulnerability down the line. Yes, and and, and sometimes the actors who agree to serve in this role have their own agendas as well, and you know can't expect they're simply going to do it for free, and so they make get some economic payoffs, they may get some diplomatic payoffs, they may get some future diplomatic payoffs in that um, their partners may be self-deterred from criticizing them on their human rights record, on any number of other um, issues with the expectation that we want to keep the situation on a low simmer and keep everybody happy. So I'm not, I'm not saying this in a normative way. This is a, just simply a description of the situation. But, you, no. You've also, uh, maybe a closing or coming to a closing reflection, you, you've also warned, despite the fact that this is your, let's say, you've written books on other matters. I yes. know it perfectly well. But you've also warned against seeing everything under the lens of Correct. weaponization. I think you called it the weaponization of the weaponization of migration. Yes. Uh, and this is a real fear. Yes. Mm. So um, I, I've, I live in this peculiar universe where uh, when I started working on this project, I had to convince people that it was actually a real thing. Now it's been, so far as I can tell, overdiagnosed. Um, and it's, it is certainly not the case that every time there's an outflow that it's an example of um, the weaponization of migration. Uh, and so now that we have a hammer, uh, I, I fear we're starting to see too many nails. Um, and so we should be careful. Uh, and so we should recognize that this happens and we should do what we can to combat it and try to prevent its use or, or not put actors in a position where they feel that they need to resort to it. At the same time, 
every time we see an outflow or a threatened outflow or, or an expected outflow, threatened outflows are pretty clear. When we see an expected outflow or we see an outflow, it's not always a case of instrumentalization. We should be careful. Well, Kelly, all I can say in closing is that it's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure to get to know you and your work over the last year. I have a feeling that you will be a frequently invited back guest to Europe we'll by, by various parties. And uh, I'd now like to close the session and invite our Director General uh, to, to, to the floor when he, uh, to make an announcement for the, the reception. <clears throat> and I just also want to thank you for the invitation and for all of you uh, for coming. Um, what, can I say one last thing? Sure. Um, I would like to imagine in some cases that this is the start of the conversation and not the end. So please uh, view my email address as an open door. Be, you know, be discriminating, be, <laughs> sending be the careful, email. Be careful, be uh, careful. But please feel free to raise additional questions. I may not answer immediately, but I will get back to you. KMG2 at MIT.edu. <laughs> Let's um, continue the conversation. Thanks to all of you, and thank you for the invitation. Thanks, Kelly. Fantastic, good.